Um, uh, Peter Angelos uh, is the Linda Kohler Anderson Professor of Surgery, the Chief of Endocrine Surgery, <clears throat> and an Associate Director of the McLean Center here at the university. Peter is an expert in the surgery of thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenal glands, uh, and endocrine surgery. Uh, since returning to the University of Chicago, where Peter had completed uh, a McLean Ethics Fellowship from 1991 to 1992, uh, Peter has emerged as one of the country's leaders in the field of surgical ethics, and in fact has brought the McLean Center into the forefront of that field. Um, Peter is a member of the Ethics Committee of the American College of Surgeons and recently became co-director of a new Surgical Ethics Fellowship that's jointly sponsored by the McLean Center and by the American College of Surgeons. Peter is currently working on writing a text in Surgical Ethics and in editing another book also on Surgical Ethics. Today, Peter will speak to us on the topic, Surgical Ethics and the Future of Surgery. Peter Edwards. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, it was, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming back for lunch. Uh, I also appreciate that. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to go rapidly through this because I feel the need to say a lot. Um, and yet I do want to allow some time for discussion. Uh, I have no disclosures, um, but I do have a few disclaimers. And as Mark mentioned, I am an endocrine surgeon. And so as an endocrine surgeon, I primarily operate on thyroids and parathyroids, occasionally on adrenal glands, but primarily thyroids and parathyroids. So uh, a translation of that is that I know an awful lot about very little. And, um, and also my approach to uh, medicine is different from many uh, physicians who actually fix things and make them better. I actually can't fix anything. All I can do is take it out. And so it's sort of a... It's a different strategy. Um, but anyway, so I will use examples that are related to thyroid surgery, but I hope that you will see them as examples um, that apply more broadly. Um, the, uh, the topic, and I must say, you know, Mark asked me if I would give a talk, and of course I'm honored to be here, and I wanted to give a talk that was appropriately vague, um, that I could change it, but also would suggest something about what it's about. And so, um, so really this idea of what does the future of surgery hold is a great uh, uh, topic, I think, because the thing about the future is that, uh, as Niels Bohr said, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. And no one, no one remembers what you said today. And so if in 10 years people say, well, let's look back and see what did Peter Angelo say, no one's going to do that because you all won't remember what I said, number one. And then even if you did remember, who cares what I said 10 years in the future? So that's the beauty of talking about the future. Um, that being said, um, I have a few suggestions about why I think um, surgical ethics is important. And um, I'm going to start, though, talking about the future by talking a little bit about the past. And so I want you to think back, if you would, to the fall of 1989. And if I were really good, I would have pictures of me in the fall of 1989 as a surgical intern down the road at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. Um, fortunately, there are no such pictures that exist, and so uh, it's not possible to show those. Um, but let me just tell you about an experience that I had that was sort of one of my early experiences with surgical innovation. And um, you have to realize just biographically, uh, my father is a general surgeon in a small town in upstate New York, uh, Plattsburgh, New York, for those of who, you who know New York. And if you know Plattsburgh, we should talk, because most people don't. Um, but uh, so, so my father's a general surgeon in Plattsburgh. And, um, and in late 1988, 1989, there was a lot of excitement in the field of general surgery about laparoscopic surgery. Right? Laparoscopic surgery was this new way of doing surgery with very small incisions and looking in with scopes, and it was really um, exciting. And uh, at Northwestern Memorial Hospital, where I was an intern, one of the surgical faculty had gone out and learned how to do this technique. 
and a number of faculty were involved. And so um, in the fall of 1989, I was one of the interns who was very excitedly looking forward to the very first laparoscopic cholecystectomy that was going to be performed at the institution. Now you have to realize, open cholecystectomies, the traditional operation was an operation that we did on a regular basis. It was one of the most common operations done in America, still is, um, although now it's laparoscopic. Um, but in those days, as, and the way surgeons talk about it, you talk about how long does an operation take? Well, you want to know how long does it take skin to skin? So that means from the time you make the incision until the time you close. Okay, so skin to skin, an open cholecystectomy by an experienced surgeon was 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes. If you're in a teaching institution, an hour, okay? So, so that's sort of the background, and, and I and a number of my intern junior resident colleagues were excited. First case was scheduled. Um, patient was brought into the operating room, was asleep in the operating room. Now, as you can imagine, there are no residents anywhere near this patient. There are three attending surgeons all scrubbed to do this very first case. Novel new operation. Now, it had been done elsewhere, obviously. We weren't at the cutting edge. But it was new for our institution. And um, after the first hour, the first port was successfully placed into the perineal cavity. And we were able to look inside with a scope and see the inside of the perineal cavity. And that was very exciting. You know, I never had that view before. It's a magnified view. It's very nice. Um, and then after another hour, all of the ports were in. And so, I can tell you that at that point I was thinking, gosh, this seems like a bad operation. <laughs> and, um, and so it, it sort of dragged on and on and you know, it was sort of picking away at tissue. And uh, after about four hours, I was really honestly hoping that my pager would go off so I would have a reason to leave the operating room. I just felt like I couldn't just leave and it would seem like I was you know, not sort of honoring the efforts of the attendings that were in the room. So anyway, um, five hours, the operation was completed successfully. The patient did great. And that evening, my father said, so we talked. He said, so you saw a lap coli. How was it? And I said of this new innovative procedure, it's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Definitely don't spend time learning how to do this because it's going nowhere. Okay? Now, I tell you that story partly because I think it's valuable to reflect on the fact that we don't often know when we're starting out down the road for a new operation if it's actually going to be a good idea or not. We don't necessarily know if it will pan out. And so sometimes the early experiences teach us this is a good idea, we should keep going. Sometimes the early experiences teach us bad idea, we should stop. Um, and it also is an example of how good a judge I am of those things, uh, which is not good. So anyway, I'm going to talk then about um, this main idea, which is that I believe innovation is both the key to surgical progress as well as the greatest challenge in surgical ethics. I'm going to talk a little bit about innovation. I want to talk briefly about progress and how we define it, and then about surgical ethics. So why is surgery today different from 100 years ago? And lots of reasons. You know, we have antisepsis today. We know a lot more about anatomy. We wear gloves, good things like that. Um, all of these things, though, are examples of innovation. And some of the innovations occur sort of in a stepwise fashion. Sometimes innovation is sort of, you know, the, the new idea, bright light goes on. Um, but the fact of the matter is, if we didn't do things differently, if we didn't try to innovate, we would never change. And so it's one of those interesting things about the emphasis on guidelines today, right? Every, everywhere in medicine, there are guidelines. But if we all followed all the guidelines all the time, we would always be doing the same things we're doing now. And so in fact, guidelines are a guide, but we have to do things differently. And in surgery, it is, uh, it's interesting that there isn't the same sort of oversight of new techniques as there is for drugs and the FDA and that sort of thing. Um, and as Henry Ford said, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So we want to do some things differently. So, 
I do think it's also important to reflect on differences. So in the business world, we think about innovation and the innovative leader as someone who is willing to take risks and you know, think outside of the box. And in surgery, innovation is a little bit different because it's not necessarily the surgeon that's taking the risk. It's the surgeon putting the patient at risk. So if I'm this, you know, if I'm an innovative surgeon and I think outside of the box, that may be great and it may have benefits to me, but it's also true that I'm potentially putting my patient at significant risk. And so I think that's an important thing we have to think about. So risk and patient safety becomes important considerations. Now, as we all know, uh, new ideas aren't always good ideas, and um, there's lots of great examples of it, and um, if you want to read an interesting book called Bad Medicine, Doctors Doing Harm Since Hippocrates, one example, there's actually several books today that you can buy about bad ideas in medicine and surgery. Um, we won't spend a lot of time on the bad ideas because, you know, they're kind of fun, but not that uh, helpful, I don't think. Um, I think one important question that we're going to have to address is how do we decide if an innovation is in fact an advance or not? And there are lots of examples that we could use, and these are some innovative techniques, laparoscopic techniques I mentioned. You know, now we do laparoscopic everything, not just laparoscopic cholecystectomies. There are robotic operations, there's endoscopic surgery, there's endovascular approaches, all kinds of cool and interesting innovative things. Um, but because I know about thyroid surgery, I'm going to just use this historical example and talk a little bit about the history of thyroid surgery very briefly. I promise it'll be brief. Um, just to allow us to reflect then on some of the specific issues that may come up with uh, new innovation. So uh, this, uh, oh goodness, it didn't show, but anyway, um, there is a, uh, there's supposed to be a really nice uh, photo here. Imagine the Gross Clinic by Thomas Eakins. It's a, it's a famous portrait in Philadelphia. I'm not sure why it's not showing up, but anyway. Um, in it is Samuel Gross. Samuel Gross was a very famous surgeon who wrote a textbook of surgery in 1866 in which he said about thyroidectomy, thus whether we view this operation in relation to the difficulties which must necessarily attend its execution is equally deserving of rebuke and condemnation. No honest and sensible surgeon, it seems to me, would ever engage in it. Now, clearly things have changed, at least a little bit, because there are, in fact, some of you in the room today who have been with me in the operating room during a thyroidectomy, and it's not that bad. You know, we, we it, it is sort of, you know, it's not uh, uh, condemnation time. It's, uh, it, it actually is much safer than in the days of Dr. Gross. And so I think it's valuable to see things have changed from the 1860s. Um, and today, in fact, um, there are many innovative approaches to thyroidectomy. And, and I'm going to go through these very rapidly, just again, for the sake of discussion, because I, I want you to get a sense of what the options are. These are really ways to, to alter the size or the location of a scar. And so, so this is an early approach using a smaller incision, also in the neck using a scope. It's known as the MEVAT, or Minimally Invasive Video Assisted Thyroidectomy. Paolo Micheli, a surgeon in Pisa, came up with this idea. It's very nice. It works well. Um, some people said, yeah, but then you still have a scar in your neck, so what about making an incision in the axilla? And so this was a Japanese approach, um, uh, going through the axilla with scopes to get to the neck. Um, this, uh, another group in Japan said, well, you know, rather than go through the axilla, why don't you go through the chest wall? It's effective. And then uh, people thought, well, why not put the two together? So this is the BABA, or bilateral axillal breast approach. And so this is another way you can take out the thyroid. Now, as you may imagine, this really hasn't taken off in the US. Um, and so, so, so it's, you know, it's, as some would say, it's a long run for a short slide. And so, so you've got to go a long ways just to get to the thyroid rather than just make a small incision in the neck. But that being said, it is an approach and it is, can be effectively done. Now, what about robotic surgery? Today, if you can do it with a robot, 
that's always better, right? Because, you know, robots are really high tech. And, you know, we advertise that we have them or we have two or whatever we have. Um, so this is a technique, robotic assisted axillary thyroidectomy. So it is going through the axilla, making a tunnel up to the neck using the robot, you know, multiple degrees of freedom, all that good stuff. Um, and it is effective. Um, and I personally tried it. I don't think it's a good operation. I don't offer it anymore. But I think, um, you know, it can be done. Uh, well, what about notes thyroidectomy? Now, for those of you who aren't in surgery, you may not be familiar with notes. So notes is natural orifice transendoscopic surgery. So note surgery is like taking the gallbladder out through the stomach. So you put a scope down the, you know, through the mouth, down the esophagus, into the stomach, you go through the stomach, grab the gallbladder, take it out, and then pull it back out. So there's no visible scar. Um, so you can take out the appendix through, through the vagina, or you could take out the appendix through the rectum, or there's lots of different ways. But the whole idea is no visible scar. So notes thyroidectomy. And so, so this slide, when I would give grand rounds in surgery, would engender a lot of laughter. And all the surgeons would say, yes, that's a great joke. Notes thyroidectomy. But in fact, you can do it. You can go through the floor of the mouth and dissect directly down to get to the thyroid. And there are a number of techniques that have been done. There are some issues with it, infection, things like that. Um, but it can be done. And so if you think, if this looks to you like, wow, that's a great technique, imagine if you added the robot, how much better it would be. <laughs> and so, so anyway, that's just to give you some sense. Now, we you know, step back from these various techniques and ask the question, are these approaches progress? And how do we know? Let's look at the morbidity. Is the morbidity, are the, are the complications, the risk of complications from the procedures lower? Absolutely not. They're higher. Is there a change in mortality? No. The risk of dying from a thyroidectomy is exceedingly low, and there's no change in mortality. So what's the difference? Well, it's a cosmetic difference. And so many people say, well, is a cosmetic difference a big enough difference to warrant doing all these things? And I would say, hard to say. So how do we decide then if these approaches or other approaches, surgical innovative approaches, how do we decide if they are progress or not? And I would say it depends on what we value. If we value not having a scar visible in the neck, then these may be seen as progress. And if not, then maybe not. But I would say if then the decision of whether something is progress depends on what we value, then it's inherently an ethical question. And so we really do need to attend to that. So let me then think with you, or if you don't mind, think with me a little bit about the ethical challenge in surgical innovation using this example of thyroid surgery, which I, you know, I just took you through a rapid historical tour. So let's think then about informed consent. How can truly informed consent be obtained for something that's innovative? Well, when we obtain informed consent, as a surgeon, I'm supposed to discuss the risks, benefits, and alternatives with my patient. But if it's really a new procedure, I don't really know exactly what the risks are. And even if I've done a procedure, let's say 50 times, if the risk of a complication is only 1 to 2 percent, I won't know if that risk is doubled unless I've done thousands of patients. So I can't really know what the risks are. And so how can I disclose the risks that are unknown? It's the unknown unknowns. Hard to say. So um, as Mark Twain said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And sometimes that's the case with innovative procedures. Um, I would suggest that there's another issue, and that is how about ensuring patient safety? We all know that there's a thing called the learning curve. We know that early in one's experience with any procedure, we'll talk about surgery, we're not as good. We get better with time. Now, I can tell you, after I had done 20 thyroidectomies during the course of my residency in surgery, I thought I was really good. And then I probably did another couple hundred during my fellowship, and I thought, well, now I'm really something. And then when I became an attending, I got a lot more experience. 
And after doing 500, I thought, well, now I think I'm as good as I'll ever get. And now after a few thousand, I think I'm actually better than when I had done 500. Now, so at some point, the, the learning curve, you know, levels off. And where you are in the learning curve, you never really know. Um, but it is true that early in one's experience, we're not as good. And so the question then is, how do we disclose that to patients? Because everything innovative, by definition, we're early in the learning curve because we don't have a lot of experience with it. And so how does that go into the calculations of the patient thinking about the risks? How do we disclose those things? Should we disclose those things? So I can tell you that if I was a patient and a surgeon said to me, I'm recommending this operation that I've never done before, but I think it would work out really well for you, I would be running out of that room as fast as I could. I can tell you when I said to a patient the first time I did a video assisted thyroidectomy, well, I'm recommending this operation that's a little bit different and you know, I, I, have, I have never done it in a live patient before. <laughs> and, and my assumption was, of course, this patient is gonna say, well, forget it, you know, I'll go see someone else. The patient said, really? You've never done it before? I said, no, you'll be the first one. She's like, that is so awesome. <laughs> now, you can't predict, but I think giving patients the information to allow them to make the decision becomes critical. Well, let me um, focus on just one more thing because I really have to end. Um, can surgeons and patients objectively assess the benefits of new procedures? So the problem is that something is touted as a new procedure. It's new and improved. Patients read about it on the internet. And then they assume that it's better because it says so on the internet. And then they come to see a surgeon. And a surgeon, let's assume that I'm the surgeon, I've learned this new technique, robotic assisted axillary thyroidectomy. I did the training, I did cadaver labs, I, I went to other institutions and watched people do it. I spent time, money, and effort to learn how to do it. And now I'm waiting for my first patient. Now, my patient comes in saying, I read about it on the internet, I understand it's the best approach ever. And literally this happened, a patient came from Wisconsin, said, Dr. Angelus, I'm so excited, I read that you can do this operation, I really want it. And she was excited, and I was excited, everyone was excited. The only problem was she didn't actually need a thyroidectomy. <laughs> so, so now, of course, you know, I didn't operate on her, but, but even though I really wanted to, uh, but, but I, I point this out, not that there's anything inherently wrong with this interaction, but the dynamic changes when a patient is convinced that something is the best operation as opposed to, yeah, you know, I know I don't really want my thyroid out, but I, you say I have thyroid cancer, so I need it out. So I, I do think it changes the dynamic and we need to be aware of it. And ultimately, the question that I started with, how do we know when to jump on the bandwagon? We don't really know. There's not a signpost that says, this is a good idea, you should do this. So I'm gonna end with just a few very final comments. How can the ethical issues in surgical innovation be managed? I would say the ethical behavior of surgeons has to be encouraged and enhanced by thoughtful self-awareness. I think that's the first step. I think informed consent has to be improved by clearly defining the uncertainties of innovation. And surgeons have to gather data to determine if patients truly benefit from these surgical innovations. Um, I think that, as I mentioned, there is no FDA for surgical procedures. And so there isn't someone else that decides whether new innovative techniques benefit our patients. And so I would say the ethical practice of surgeons is necessary to ensure that what is new is not automatically assumed to be improved. And surgeons have to make individual decisions about what to offer patients. And so ultimately, that becomes then an, ethical, uh, an ethically charged situation. So my conclusion is not all innovative techniques are good, clearly. Potential benefits need to be weighed against risks. Surgeons need to actively engage in clinical trials or registries in order to uh, assess risks and benefits. Um, informed consent has to address the uncertainties. That has to be clearly disclosed. And we need to ensure that all surgical innovation benefits patients and not just us. Because if I've come up with a new technique and it's on the internet, I'm gonna get a lot of patients. That's gonna be good for me. Whether it's good for patients or not, 
is open for discussion. And I would suggest that this idea, it should be good for patients and not just for surgeons, is really the epitome of ethical practice, which is why I started with this idea that I think innovation is both the key to future surgical progress as well as the greatest challenge in surgical ethics. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it. Mary. The language that I'm focusing on here is the use of the term innovative practice as potentially distinct, but maybe not distinct, from experimental practice. And the latter term conjures up a lot more concerns. Thank you. Than the former. Um, now I know, we, and we all know, surgery has different criteria. You don't go through the FDA for procedures. I'll grant you, because it's certainly part of your talk, that innovative practices have certainly improved surgery for patients right. and not just, just for doctors. It seems to me that can all also be said, though, of experimental treatments. So say something about what you see as a potential distinction, if there is one, between the two terms. Yes, no, excellent point, Mary. So, so I, I guess I would say, I mean, first of all, I think our assumption is that innovation is good, that something that is new is always better. That's our assumption. It's not a correct assumption, and it's not the assumption of medicine, but it's the assumption of the American public, which is why we all have to buy the next iPhone, right? Our, my, my old iPhone still dials. It works, but I have to buy the new one because it's new and improved. It does something more. So, so I do think that the, using innovation, innovation, an innovative technique automatically suggests that it's better, and we don't know that it necessarily is. It's different. The second point, though, that you make is an excellent one, and that is that I think experimentation, um, so experimental surgery, I think suggests that it is in a research context. And so I would say early on, we should push innovative procedures into a research context, but frequently they don't start there. And so that's the other thing that I think gets challenging. So often innovation occurs without research oversight, without IRBs, but the more rapidly it's pushed into the research arena to become experimental, the more rapidly we'll gather data to know actually if it's better or not. Thanks. Rachel. So as we think about moving away from fee-for-service to pay for performance, does the monetary impact of your innovations come into play now more than it did before? Uh, it's an excellent question. I believe that the answer is going to be uh, yes, um, although it's a little hard to know how it's going to play out. So, so I do think that if we try things out, um, and it's if we know that we, there are more financial penalties associated with things that don't work as well, I do think that that is going to reduce the likelihood of sort of doing things very differently. I think it's going to mean that frequently changes happen in a more stepwise fashion and not so much as sort of the big new idea, but rather much more incrementally. Because I do think the financial ramifications of choosing wrong on that, you know, is this a good idea or not? Should we invest in it or not? I think that there's going to be a lot more conservatism. Yeah. Thanks. Last question. Thank you. A little bit of an aside, but you talked about learning curves being better after several thousand. Concurrent surgery has been uh, in the news of late. Any thoughts about that? Uh, you know, it's an excellent uh, point, and I uh, would love to spend time talking about it, but one of the speakers in a short time on this panel, Dr. Alex Langerman, will be addressing that very topic. So 